Today I'd like to talk about reframing nature in our planning system to deliver community resilience to uh, future climate stresses. And I want to start with a quick story, um, which was last week, I was privileged to be part of around 30 experts who met online to advise a the ABC about a new artificial reality project that they have um, planned as part of their Big Weather and How to Survive It documentary series. So we were asked to dream up what a truly resilient city would look like in the face of flood and fire, drought and, and uh, cyclones, etc. cetera. Uh, and they invited fire chiefs and planners, um, engineers together to sort of come up with these solutions. I think they're really anticipating some, you know, technological fixes and some really smart cities ideas. And what was really fascinating <laughs> was that the entire conversation focused around the idea of nature-based solutions. We talked about urban forests and rooftop gardens to lower temperatures and, and slow you know, storm water. Um, we talked about mangroves and wetlands as the solution to storm surge. And we talked about you know, fire resistant vegetation um, planted strategically to reduce fire risk. And even you know, the idea of embracing fire uh, as a natural element of the landscape. Um, we also talked importantly about this idea of everyday nature experiences for people to enhance their health and well-being and their resilience in the face of future climate stresses. Um, you know, maybe perhaps that was kind of stimulated in part through people's COVID experiences in lockdown, understanding how important nature um, exposure is in, um, in these times of, of stress. Um, and also in, in terms of generating that sort of importance of um, stewardship and care for nature that we know is so critical for the future of, future of nature and biodiversity. Anyway, I just, I reflected, I suppose, on the fact that I don't reckon we would have had that conversation five years ago. Now, I think that relatively quickly, the world has probably shifted its thinking to embracing the idea of nature as a key part of our resilience in the face of future challenges. And it's not confined to city planning. Um, anyone who ten, attends agricultural forums will know the idea of regenerative farming. Um, it's talked about a lot. Um, the idea that we, that food production may well critically depend on how us embracing rather than fighting natural processes. This um, food and agriculture organisation report is really worth a read. It urgently calls for new forms of agriculture that integrate and enhance biodiversity. And this is to ensure food security. So to its credit, I think the state government in Victoria has probably to some level embraced this idea of nature and development going hand in hand. And it's reflected at a high level in, uh, this, in this Biodiversity 2037 document. But anyone who's working at the coalface, someone who, anyone who's an environmental consultant or working as an uh, environmental officer in a local government or, or actually as an officer in DELP who deals with, with uh, planning applications will know that biodiversity and development are still very much at loggerheads in our planning system. And that is why we continue to have declines rather than increases in vegetation in this state. And that's why we continue to have losses of biodiversity moving forward. So that's my big challenge that I'm posing today, is really how we turn that around. How we move from that high level vision and um, funnel it down to the reality of on ground planning, policy and implementation for nature in this state. I've got a few ideas uh, that I'll leave you with. I think the first one is that we have to reframe nature. When you read planning documents, nature is referred to often as a problem to be dealt with. Actually you talked about as a constraint, there's a constraint layer. That's, not, that's bad language and bad thinking in this space. We need to reframe nature as a massive asset to be maximised at every step of the planning system, planning process. Secondly, that probably means moving away from offsets as part, offsetting nature as, as part of the solution. Under this approach, vegetation can be cleared in one place and offset usually quite far away from the impact site as a, as a compensation. But this fails to deliver that everyday nature that I mentioned at the start of the talk. Our work shows it actually fails to generate respectful attitudes towards nature. Um, and it also perpetuates this notion that biodiversity is fundamentally incompatible with development. So we need to replace that concept 
with what we call onsetting. Um, so in a city, um, we're working with developers to, to, uh, to deliver onsets in the form of what we call biodiversity sensitive urban design. So here you can enhance the on-site benefits to biodiversity while delivering really successful and resilient urban communities. Likewise, the same can be done in agricultural communities. This is a kind of new certification idea that's being, um, being designed, um, whereby farmers can be assisted in enhancing the on-site biodiversity in their, in their properties while retaining kind of you know, reasonable levels of production and even in, in, uh, and <coughs> securing sort of premiums to be paid for their, for their products. So in summary, I have argued today that the future resilience of communities, regional, rural, and even in our biggest cities in Victoria may critically depend on this new conceptualization of nature. Nature is an opportunity um, and as compatible or even necessary element for development that is resilient uh, to future climate stresses. Thank you. <laughs>